Over to you, sir. All right. I should probably share my screen. That would probably work. <laughs> there goes the salty language. Not necessarily, Brent. Eh? <laughs> um, so, all right. I see the recording has started. Let me just uh, share my screen over here as well and then bring my Teams window back up. I hate that it always minimizes it when I do this because then I can't see the chat. Uh, but there we go. All right. So, um, oh, sorry, so, Ben, one question for me before yeah. you start. How do you want to handle questions and things? Leave them till um, the end? Shout out? You know what? I actually have the chat window open beside me on uh, on one of my many monitors here, so I will actually uh, watch what's going on on that, and awesome. um, and then yeah, we'll we'll try and triage it. If there's questions that I uh, I decide that I'll need to come back to, I'll just kind of uh, either I'll call it out or I'll, I'll come back to them later, whichever. So I uh, will make sure that uh, that we get hopefully everybody's questions answered here. So. Perfect. All right, so um, so here we go. So today we're going to be talking about quickly solving the slowly changing dimension challenge. Uh, and the big thing that I'd like to uh, sort of call out on this is that we're going to be looking at type 2 slowly changing dimensions for both Excel and Power BI, although all of this will be demoed in Excel. Um, just to give you a brief intro as to who I am, if you don't know who I am, uh, my name's Ken. Um, I am an FCPA, FCMA. Uh, that means that I'm an accountant officially credited in Canada. And uh, I run a little website called xlguru.ca. We have a website, a blog, and a forum there where we like to help people out. Uh, I am also the founding partner, or one of the founding partners of skillwave.training. Uh, that's a, a joint effort between myself and Matt Allington and Miguel Escobar are the original founding partners. And uh, what we have there is we've got some awesome uh, self-service business intelligence training uh, where we focus on both uh, Excel and Power BI. Uh, we've actually just uh, released a new course from Reed Havens on data visualization as well. So uh, we're trying to build this up to be the place to go and get really good uh, Excel and Power BI training. Uh, if you haven't checked this out, you really should. We've got all kinds of awesome stuff there that we're super proud of. Uh, I am a Microsoft MVP. I have been since 2006, so going on about 15 years now. Spent 10 years as a, an Excel MVP, spent uh, five here, or I guess that's three, uh, as a data platform MVP, which is the category that looks after Power BI. In 2019, I moved back into Office Apps and Services, which is the category that looks after Excel, as well as all the other op Office applications. Uh, I like to tell people that just like my work career, I've spent a lot of time uh, sort of bouncing back and forth between accounting and IT. Um, that sort of, uh, you know, exhibited inside these uh, these channels of uh, MVP awards as well. It's kind of a neat thing there. Um, in addition, I'm a man with many hats. I do all kinds of stuff. I've written a little book that you may have heard of called M is for Data Monkey. Yes, we are working on the second edition. Yes, it will be out by the end of the year, I promise. Um, so we'll try and get that out of the side of things. Uh, I've also written a, um, a software called uh, Monkey Tools, which is an add-in to Excel. And uh, this is a, a tool that we use to help us actually uh, do some cool stuff and actually make uh, life a little bit easier because I'm one of these kind of crazy guys who likes to spend about 90 hours programming how to do things in order to save myself five minutes uh, when I need it most. All right. Now, now that you've seen me, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to turn my camera off for the rest of the presentation because we are trying to you know, cover like the whole world here. I know we've got people in Perth. We've got people in uh, Romania that, uh, that I see here all the way across and points in between. So I'm going to try and preserve as much bandwidth as I can for the actual presentation uh, on screen here. Now, um, because I've just uh, just mentioned Monkey Tools, I do want to call out a little bit here. Uh, full disclosure, we are going to see Monkey Tools in use today. Uh, the bulk of the session here, what I'm going to be doing is I'm actually going to be doing things manually first. And then what we're going to do is we're going to come back and we're going to use Monkey Tools to show you how we can actually do it a little easier. Uh, the model that we work with when we're building and developing Monkey Tools is this. Our whole idea here is to build better models faster. And that's why near the end of the session, I'm going to take all the stuff that I actually show you as far as building a slowly changing dimension. And there are a lot of steps to this. And we'll redo everything with Monkey Tools, and you'll see exactly what I mean by faster. Um, the target model or audience for Monkey Tools, if you haven't heard of it or haven't seen it yet, uh, is Excel users that are trying to build models with Power Query and Power Pivot. 
We also target users who need to audit their models that they receive from others, whether those models actually come from Excel or Power BI. And we do have some overlap in the feature sets, although uh, I like to do everything myself personally in Excel because I have much more granular control over what can happen there. Unfortunately, uh, while I can write measures to Power BI, I can't write queries there. And uh, a big part of what I do is actually around the query side of things. So uh, it's one of the reasons why I actually start in Excel for virtually everything that I do and eventually port some models to Power BI if I need them. Um, my pricing model for, uh, for Monkey Tools, uh, just to make sure uh, you're fully aware of this up front going in, uh, we have a forever free version. This is our sort of uh, version that I'd love to see people use in the community. It's got all kinds of useful features in here, um, and it will always be forever free for these particular things. Uh, we include updates. All that kind of stuff happens on a regular basis as well. We do have a pro license as well, um, and we have a trial of that, a two-week free trial that you can actually use. Uh, everything in the pro version with the exception of one auditing report is completely free for the two weeks of the trial pro. Um, the only thing that's different in that one, as I say, is a specific auditing report. Uh, we believe that one has a lot of value. And if you're auditing models that uh, you can help us with our development costs that we're putting into this. And of course, we have a pro license subscription as well. If you're interested, uh, you can go and you can check out the link here at xlguru.ca slash monkey tools. That'll give you all of the pricing information and uh, some of the features that are in there and all that kind of good stuff. And that's as much as I'm going to dwell on this for right now. We're going to move on into what I actually want to talk about today, which is how we're actually going to look at the slowly changing dimensions. And what we're going to do is we're going to start first by just talking a little bit about a simple data model solution that we have here. I want to just cover quickly, though, my design philosophy on what I actually work with when I'm building a model inside Excel or Power BI. It always starts the same way. We start from raw data. Now, this usually is real data because, you know, if it's not real data, you're making it up and that's not really ethical. So we always start from data. And then what we do is we use Power Query to go and do a certain job for us. And that job is all about sourcing and reshaping the data to get it into the right shape in order to be able to analyze it later. When I do this, I always use three levels of queries at a minimum in order to get this done. I have a specific query for raw data, which basically means I connect to the data source. And the only purpose of this query here is basically to normalize the data, get it into nice, clean rows and columns. And it's really all about me being able to see all of the data that I have access to. In the staging layer, that's where I go back and I do a lot more work, where I'm going to be reshaping data, or I'm going to be reducing data, getting rid of garbage rows, or, or dropping columns that I don't need. Raw data is about seeing what I have access to. Staging is about reshaping it to get it into the proper format to drive most everything. The final step in this is to actually build my fact tables and dimension tables inside these areas here. I might be merging tables together or doing different things that come from the staging queries. But generally, this is one of the, the sort of structural layers that I find is really, really handy for building my models up to make them robust so that when things change, I actually have the ability to react to that change and actually have my model last a, a, you know, a longer time. Once we've got our fact and dimension tables, you'll notice they're green. There's no accent to that. They get loaded into the data model. So these, these queries here, everything else, raw data staging, these are, if you're in Power BI, we disable the load. If you're in Excel, we load them as connection only. Same thing, basically. Uh, the fact and dimension tables, though, get loaded into the data model, Power Pivot in Excel or the data model inside Power BI. Inside there, we also do other things like relate our tables together, create our DAX formulas, and then from there, we go and we create our visuals that actually consume these to actually get the information we're looking for. So that's the philosophy that I use when I'm building these things up. And you're going to see that that actually um, becomes evident really quickly here when I take a look at this simple data model that I've actually got here. The source of this data, we've got four Excel tables that are going to be living inside the host workbook. Uh, is this a best design practice? Arguably not. Probably your table should live in a different workbook, not in the host workbook. But the reality is a lot of Excel pros are building their data from the stuff that's in the host workbook anyway. And we're just going to make life easy and we're going to use that for this because it's nice and portable. Uh, all the data is imported to Power Pivot via Power Query. And it is going to be using a raw data staging data model workflow like I just showed you on the previous slide. There is one other table that is built here dynamically, and that is my calendar table. It's generated via Power Query. Uh, I'm not going to go into the full details of how this is built. That's a whole different session, um, but this is all done in Power Query. 
Uh, this all lands in the data model, which looks like this. The data model's got five tables. It's got five relationships. Every one of them, of course, is a one-to-many relationship because that's the only option you have in Excel. If this was in Power BI, you could also do one-to-one -one or many-to-many. <laughs> um, but uh, ultimately, I mean, for the majority of data models that I build, I'm trying to do everything with the one-to-many join as the natural join that we want between these things. I've also got three measures, uh, budget dollars, sales dollars, and transactions. And I've got one pivot table. And if I jump over and show you uh, in Excel what that actually looks like, uh, here is my workbook. I've got my uh, individual tables. So I've got a table of sales, cast or categories, budgets, and customers. And if I go and quickly pop this open here, you'll see that uh, there are a lot of queries that are actually pulling all this together. So here they are. And if I jump in, I'll just go and take a, a quick look at, uh, at one of them budgets here, and I'm going to show you the workflow that I'm actually using before we jump into this whole thing. So let's let this guy do its refresh of the preview. If I go to View and Query Dependencies, let me just maximize this so you can see it all. What you can see is we have our workbook. Here's my raw data table for categories, for budgets, for sales, and for customers. You can see that it goes from raw data into my staging layer and then eventually loads to the data model. My budgets do the same thing, but I've also got this other query over here called end date. This is to drive my calendar along with start date, which is coming from my sales. Basically what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the earliest date in the sales table and the latest date in the budgets table. And I'm building a calendar that spans from the earliest to the latest date across those two tables so that it automatically self updates as I get new data. As I say, that's a whole other session to actually go through and show you how I did that. But you can see the flow here that everything is running through this, this raw data staging and then eventually to data model layers. And if I take a look, um, you can see that that's exactly how I've organized things. Here's my raw data connections. If I look at categories, you can see it's only got a couple of steps. One is pulling from the Excel table and setting the data types. If I look up to categories here, You'll notice that again, it's pulling from the raw data categories table, setting data types, and then categories again is basically the same thing. So very simple right now, but it could get a little bit more complicated. Um, my start date and end date for calendars are a little bit more complicated. If I look at my source, you can see it's pulling from my staging budget tables. There's a few different steps that it goes through in order to generate the end of the year for the latest date. This is my fiscal year. Uh, the same thing happens in start date, so a few steps there in my staging area. And then I actually build my calendar table, which goes from one to the other, so from my start date to the end date. And then it walks through a whole bunch of steps for a recipe that I have in order to go back and build out a nice fleshed out calendar table that self updates. All of that data is going to end up feeding into the data model. And we'll just open that guy up. Here we go, so we've got all of our individual tables. And if I look at diagram view, you can see that there is the data model, all nicely set up, nice and simple, only five tables, nothing super big. Um, the big thing that I'm gonna be working here is I've got a customer, uh, filtering customer here, and we're gonna be playing with that in a little bit. If we go over to take a look at the report, I've got a single pivot table over here, and uh, the hero of this particular show here is gonna be our friend Alan Frizzell right here. You'll notice that all of his sales that he's incurred with us over uh, over X number of times, uh, this is fun. This is food and beverage. Alan drinks a lot. Um, so all of these uh, sales here have been happening in Surrey. And you'll notice right now that there's absolutely nothing in Abbotsford. And by the time the show is done, this is going to change a little bit here. So right now, I, I think the big thing that I really want to sort of push out or, or point out on this whole thing is that this data model works. And, I, and if I just go and click uh, refresh all, you'll be able to see that all of these tables here are gonna start spinning and they're gonna do a nice little reload and everything is gonna work just fine. No problem. And this is sort of the first you know, blush of models that we would actually end up building uh, as an Excel Pro is one that hopefully ends up working and everything ticks along just fine, at least until it doesn't. So this is where we're gonna move into um, what I can certainly say for me as I started actually building these things became a bit of a world of hurt. And it's one of these areas where you've got your model all set up and everything's working really, really well, and then things change. Now, if your things change in your fact table, that's not really a big deal, right? You're always expecting more data and duplicates to come into that area. But when you've got something like a dimension 
Maybe it looks like this. It's got a primary key of customer ID. So those are supposed to be our unique values that show up on the one side of the relationship. And then we've got a whole bunch of other data of dimensional fields, the way we slice things. So in this case, you can see in the case of province, we've got repeating information. And that's all cool as long as the repeats never end up in the primary key. The problem always happens with this stuff is when things change. So if we've got this particular settings or you know, set up here, the most dangerous thing to happen is that, you know, the phone will ring and there's a customer on the other end and it's Fred. And Fred says, listen, there's something wrong with the setup on my account. You say, really? What, what's wrong? And he says, you spelled street wrong. You've got an S-T and it's supposed to be S-T-E or R-E-E-T. Can you fix that? And that's when, you know, you, you sit there and you have a nice little conversation with Fred and, or, um, and you start thinking, really, man, like, come on, is your mail getting to you or whatever? So we might carefully go back and, and explain to Fred and say, listen, you know what, there's a character limit on the field. That's all we could get in there. So unfortunately, you know what, I'm going to treat this as a type zero, slowly changing dimension. I won't tell Fred that, uh, but basically we're going to ignore the change. And that's where we just don't want to deal with it or we don't need to deal with it. Basically type zero, ignore it. So we hang up the phone. Fred goes away, maybe he's happy, maybe he's not, but he still gets his mail, it's all good. And then the phone rings again, and it's Mary. And Mary says, hi, I'd like to make a change to my account because my account has me listed as John and I don't go by John anymore. Can you please update my record so that my name is Mary? Now this is obviously something that we need to change. We need to change it quickly. And we don't particularly want to return any history because as far as we're concerned, Mary's Mary. Mary doesn't want to be known as John anymore. This is what we call a type one slowly changing dimension. And this is where we go through and we just overwrite the value. So at this point you can see record number three is now Mary. That's it, plain and simple done. The commonality between both a type zero and a type one slowly changing dimension is that there's no history ever preserved. So we can never go back and reanalyze these values based on what happened in the past. But it's okay because we're, we're all right with that. We hang up the phone, Mary's happy, and the phone rings again. And this time it's Bob, and he's moved. And he didn't ask our permission for that. We can't ignore it because we don't want to overwrite his history because if we're doing our sales analysis by city and Bob's moved to a new city, we want to know without compromising our old sales record where Bob was and where Bob is. So we need to actually preserve the historical information. And this is where we get into what we call a type two slowly changing dimension, where we need to go and add a new record, because you can see now that Bob's moved from Surrey into Vancouver, and we want to be able to track those sales separately. But this obviously now causes a problem, because we now have two entries of Bob's customer ID number inside our primary key column. And if you've ever dealt with this in Excel or in Power BI, you'll know the symptom is when you hit refresh and it comes back and it tells you, I'm sorry, but we can't update that table because there's duplicate values in a column where one column is expected or something along those lines. And you're stuffed. You can't update your dimension anymore. And this is not a lot of fun, especially if you don't know how to solve the problem. So usually it has some panic. When does it happen? Oh, probably right when you got about five minutes before a presentation. I mean, uh, to, you know, to your boss or whatever else. These are the challenges, right? Like it, it's never a good thing. So the question is, how do we actually go through and solve this particular problem? Because we actually can solve it if we know how. And it involves a couple of things. The first thing is, is that we need to add some effective dates columns to our table. We always know, and this is the easy part, when our records actually start. That's simple, right? And, and if you don't have the answer to that, you just do it from the first day of whatever your reporting period is, or the first day your business existed, it doesn't really matter. Um, the, the next part that you actually need though, is we need to make sure that we actually have a two column. So the two column is where we're going to actually be looking at things and saying, all right, what date does Bob cease to be at that nowhere close address? Okay, so that's going to be uh, the next part uh, that we're actually looking for here. So once we've got that sort of set up, with a, a, so we can see here that we've actually got a nice effective uh, two date here for Bob. So February 15th, he's moving out of this address. February 16th, he starts the next. And this is an important component too, is we wanna make sure that we go from one day and then the next day it starts at the new location. You can't live in two places at once. That's not allowed for our slowly changing dimension, okay? So 
The next thing that we're going to do with this, that only helps us know what's going on. It doesn't actually solve the primary key issue. So what we're going to do is we're going to add one more thing to this. We're going to create what we call a surrogate key. And basically, it's called a surrogate. Uh, everything else in this table, whether it's a primary key or not, is called a natural key because they're naturally occurring data that's real. The surrogate is something that we make up. Okay, so the idea here is that we're going to make up something that is going to act as a new primary key, unique values. And you can see when I look at this one here that Bob's first record is 2.001 and Bob's second record is 2.002. Okay, so these now are unique entries that we're actually looking at. What we're then going to do once we've actually got these unique entries is we need to replace those in our fact table so we can make the relationship based on those instead of the original primary key. So that's the whole secret behind the slowly changing dimension. Now I'm going to go back and I'm just going to show you here really quickly. We're going to actually replicate this particular problem. So we're going to take Alan here. So Alan's going to come down and he's going to move to us somewhere. Uh, he's actually going to move in with Beth Ann. She's uh, decided that, um, that he's all right. And uh, that's going to happen effective uh, 2018-06-30. So uh, Alan moves in on 2018-07-01. Okay. And now, What's going to happen? We're going to right click and we're going to refresh that customer's table. And at this point, boom, there we go. The customer ID has a duplicate value. We can't do this. It's not going to let us do it. And at this point, of course, everybody freaks out because our data model is now broken. And this is what we need to try and fix because we need to allow our people to move, you know, at least once or twice. I mean, that's, you know, we don't want to actually pin everybody in the same house all the time. So, how are we going to do this? The creating a slowly changing dimension takes about four steps. There's a recipe behind this whole thing here. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an overview roadmap, and then we're going to go into a full demo of building this whole thing through. So the roadmap kind of looks like this. Step one is we need to ensure that a from and to column exists inside our dimension. And we need to make sure that both of them contain a complete list of values. And this is going to be important because as it stands right now, we don't usually put an end date on people when they haven't moved. We don't know when that date's going to be. So we don't want to fill in something that's going to accidentally lead to problems. So we need to come up with a way to make sure that these columns are completely populated where most times in the data they won't be. At least the from date always will, but the to date won't necessarily. Once we've got that, the second step is that we need to go and add our surrogate key to the dimension itself. So we need to generate that. And there's two potential options for your surrogate key. The first one is where we generate a surrogate key that has no meaning. The second one is where we generate a surrogate key that has meaning. And these things are very, very different. If you talk to a true um, BI modeler, they will tell you that you should always use surrogate keys without meaning. You should not be trying to imply meaning into something that you're creating on the fly. The thing about these guys here is they're super easy to create, but as a self-service BI person, if you're trying to audit through your model and you're looking from one table to another, it becomes very difficult to actually trace the bouncing ball because the number is nonsensical. It doesn't really mean anything at all, whether it's a number or a piece of text. The other option is to go with surrogate keys with meaning. The challenge is that while they're much easier to trace because they have meaning, they're much harder to create and they have a performance penalty potentially as well, depending on how big your data set is. So just a couple of things to, to look at. I'm actually going to show you both of these today, although I'm only going to build one of them manually, and that's the keys uh, without meaning. Once you've got your keys, we need to create a specific query in order to basically bridge from the dimension and replace the original foreign key that matches to the primary key in the dimension table. We need to replace those with the surrogate key. So this is done by a, a little merging magic inside Power Query. Um, one of the big pieces of advice that I'm going to give you on this is that if you're doing this manually, and I'm going to give you the recipes to do this manually, if you are going to do it manually, before you start doing this, please delete the relationship between your dimension and your fact table, um, because otherwise, every time you try and save one of your queries, you're going to end up getting all these error messages. It's just going to be absolutely nasty and, and really, really painful. And uh, you know, Excel doesn't like error messages. Sometimes it does nasty things with them like crash. So we don't want to actually see that happen. Now. Like I said, this is the overview slide. This is the big roadmap of what we're going to do. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to jump into a demo and I'm going to work through the process of 
fixing this entire thing manually. And what we're going to do is we're going to build a slowly change in dimension using keys without meaning. And I'll walk you through the entire process. And then I'll show you um, afterwards, we'll come back and we'll actually look at all of the recipe slides. Uh, and I will provide you guys all these. Uh, I'll send a, a copy to Win so it can get posted on the, uh, the meetup group for, uh, for all these different things, uh, as well as the data samples. So the first thing that we're going to do is we want to make sure that we can get rid of this uh, this little error here we have with the load to data model failing. So, oh, that's cool. I didn't realize they actually have the send a frown thing right on here for Microsoft. Now, I don't know what they would do with this if I send a frown because my data model is bad, but I might want to try that one day. Uh, at any rate, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into the, uh, the managed data model here. Um, I'm going to jump into my diagram view, and I'm going to go over here, grab my little relationship, and I'm just going to delete it. Now, the reality is the relationship's not working anyway. So not a big deal. We're going to get rid of that. And uh, at that point in time, this guy is, is all good. We can now go back here and we should be able to go back, right click and refresh our query and get our customer's table to actually load properly. So there we go. We now have 11 rows. We just can't link it because we've got duplicate values. No big deal. What we're now going to do is we're going to start working through the recipe steps for actually solving this particular issue. And the first thing that we need to do is we need to make sure that our dimension table has both a from and a to column, which you can see it already does. If it didn't, you'd need to add these to your data source, okay? But it does have them. But the problem is that this has got a lot of blanks because we don't know when these people are going to move. I don't know how long Alan's going to be staying here, so we've left it open-ended. I have seen people that put in the years like 299999, but uh, I don't know. That's not, a, that's not a great practice to me. I'd prefer to leave it open. So... In order to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into the queries that I use to reshape my data, which is my staging layer. So I'm going to jump into staging customers here, and I'm going to go and take a look at this guy here and, and make some changes to the way that this thing is set up. So you can see that we've got our from and we've got our to. The first thing is that I got to figure out what do I want to put in this area? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the recipe to actually generate today's date in Power Query and actually replace that in here. The way that I prefer to do this is to actually open this up and go and create myself a new query. So we're going to go new query from other sources. We're going to create a blank query. And I'm going to call this guy here today because why not? That's a logical name. This is going to use a very simple formula, which is going to be equals date dot from open parenthesis. And it's going to be date time dot local now open close parenthesis, there we go. And I'm not gonna hit enter on this line because it always gives me a hard return. I'm just gonna click the little check mark on this. And what you'll see is that it now gives me April 7th, 2021, which for me is today. I know that uh, you know I'm speaking from the past even though I'm live for, uh, for folks in Perth. You guys are already on the 8th. Um, I hope it's a good day for you. Come, please send it good, good stuff my way. Uh, so there we go. We've got April 4th, or sorry, April 7th. Now here's the deal though. This is a very special type of query. This is what we call a scalar query. This is a specific single data point. And you can actually recognize that because we've got a calendar table looking thing here. If I go and take a look at say staging customers, you'll notice that it's got a table icon and it looks like a table. It's got headers, it's got row numbers. If I go and look at these guys here, start date and end date, you'll notice that they have the same icon as my today. So if I go and look at end date, this is a scalar. Interestingly enough, the previous step is not. It's actually a table. So when you're actually building and following my calendar patterns, we actually need you to turn your data into a scalar value. And the way that I did this, just for reference, is to right-click on this item and hit drill down. And that drills it down into a scalar right there, just the same as what I got from today. The implication of this, I don't actually have to use today's date. I could use the end date query but the recipe slides that I'm going to give you are actually all based around today's date. And that's why I want to try and keep this consistent. Okay. So I've created today. I'm now going to go back over to my staging customers and I'm going to fill today into these areas here. And to do that, we're going to go right click and we're going to do a replace values. And in the replace values, I'm going to replace null. What I'd really like to do is choose today right here. Unfortunately, I can either put in a date 
or I can create a new parameter because the today query is a query. It is not a parameter. And unfortunately, to get this to be all sort of nice and easy to work with, um, not so much for today. This would be easy to do as a parameter, but for my start date and end date, because they're completely dynamic, parameters don't work for that. So we actually have to do this the hard way. Because I can't put in the actual name of the query itself, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fake it with, an, uh, with another date. So we're going to go 2021-1-31. That'll do. January 31st. The notice that it fills in nicely. And here's the important part. Up in the formula bar, you can see this is what got entered. And that's all we're trying to do here is get a date so we can find this and replace it with today. Okay, so there we go. Once we've got that nicely in place and we hit enter, you'll now see that my today's date is in here. Why do I pick today? Because it's unlikely that I'm going to be selling past today's date for my sales table. And, and it's unlikely my customers are going to actually tell me um, about stuff in advance when they're going to be moving. I mean, sometimes they potentially do, but I can always fill that in and, and deal with that later. All right. That's step one. Filling my, making sure that my, my um, customer's table uh, or my dimension table has my dates and they're fully populated. Now, I've done this in staging. Remember that my customer's table actually pulls from that. So if I go and take a look there, fantastic. The source step is pulling. It's already got all this information in. So that looks pretty good. I'm now going to go back to my staging customers and I'm going to move on to step two, which is creating the surrogate key that I'm going to need. So I have my customer ID, but it's got duplicates right now. I'm going to make this easy. What we're going to do is we're going to create the surrogate key without meaning. And the recipe for this is, uh, is fairly easy. This is optional, this piece here. I'm going to sort by the customer ID. Okay. And then I'm going to sort by the from date in ascending order. Now, it's optional. You don't need to do it because these numbers don't actually have any meaning. But what I like about this is that at least it does put all of Alan's records up here in order so I can actually see what instance we're actually working with of his particular setup here. To create the surrogate key, I now go add column, index column. And again, this is optional. You can go from zero, you can go from one. I like to use one because I start counting from one. Power Query often starts counting from zero. So whether you're a zero-based person or a one-based person is totally up to you. But the big thing that you got here is that we now start off record, uh, customer record number one is Alan for this particular period in time. Customer number two record is Alan for this particular period of time. Customer three record is now Beth Ann. Even though her customer ID is two, we have a surrogate key of three. So this is, as I say, it's not tied back and doesn't mean anything. It's just an index. Okay. Now we're going to rename this though. I'm going to call this one LNK, which is my shortcut for link. And then I burn that whole one character savings by putting in an underscore. And I'm going to call this one customer ID. Uh, I'm going to get rid of the space. There we go. Link customer ID. Beautiful. That is now my surrogate key. Okay, so I've made it up as I go along. Now, again, you can make these numbers anything. You can increment them by 10 if you want to. It doesn't really matter what they are, as long as every item on this table becomes unique. And that's where these index numbers are really, really good for this. Once again, if we go back to customers and we take a look at this one here, we can see that all of that information is flowed through nicely. Okay, so that is step two, which is creating our surrogate key, this one without meaning. And I'll show you the with meaning a little bit later on. The next step in the process that we needed to do is we need to actually create a bridge table in order to be able to actually take this surrogate key and merge it back into the fact table sales that I used on the relationship because this customer ID here isn't gonna work anymore. I need to replace that with the surrogate key. That's what the whole sort of magic is that goes around with this particular recipe. So in order to do this, I'm gonna go back to staging customers, which has all of the information. This tells me when these keys are supposed to be active from, what the old one is, what the new one is. I'm gonna right click on here and I'm gonna choose reference. This will create me a new query called Staging Customers 2. That's very helpful and very aptly named, but I'm going to change this one here to, uh, I'm going to go with S key bridge. Um, so just my sort of nomenclature so I know what it's all about. And I'm going to call it S key bridge customers. The reason why I put dash customers on the end is because this is one dimension in my model, but I might end up with other slowly changing dimensions. So this is actually setting myself up for success in the future so that I know what I'm actually dealing with if I end up having to deal with multiple slowly changing dimensions. It sounds like a nightmare, it is, but at the same time, again, we can do it. And that's the important thing. Now, 
this guy has a very specific recipe that we want to follow. And the first part of that is we grab the from column and the to column, and we change the data type on these. We take them and change them from date to be a whole number. This is going to switch these from date into the date serial number. And this is really, really important because the next step I actually can't do by using dates. I need to actually use numbers. And what that's going to be all about right now is we're going to go and add a custom column to our data set. Even though it's numbers, it's going to be called dates. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create what we call a list in Power Query. So that starts off with a curly brace. And we're going to go from the value in the from column dot dot this is kind of like excel's colon but lying down so from there to the value in the two column and we'll close the curly brace okay this formula if you're following my recipe is always exactly the same you can copy and paste this it works just fine we can say okay and at this point in time we now get this cool thing here which is a list this list gives us a list of all of the individual dates that we actually have um, Christian's asking, could we use number.from from and number.from to? Uh, yes, you absolutely could. You don't have to convert it to dates beforehand if you don't want to. Um, I would say I usually follow the recipe pattern this way anyway, though, um, but uh, you absolutely could if you wanted to do that. Uh, the next uh, item that I'm going to do at this point in time, now that I have my nice little list of dates here, I'm going to grab the customer ID, the link customer ID, and the dates column itself. So just the three that I've actually uh, working here, the important parts, all of this was just helpers to get to where I need to be. What I'm going to do is say right click, remove other columns. So we're bringing it right down to just the key components. Here's the original customer ID. This is the new customer ID. And when I expand this to new rows and then convert it to date, this gives me a massively long virtual table with every single day what the customer ID original number is from the prior, from the original foreign key and what the new customer ID will be. Now we can see if we scroll down uh, down to halfway through June here, or sorry, to June, uh, went a little bit too far, here we are. Uh, right here at day 182, this is where our friend moved. So he's now become, he's gonna be coming link customer ID number two. And if I scroll down um, like a thousand rows, 1100 rows, you can see where a customer, a customer ID, the original customer ID number two, which is Beth Ann, um, requires customer ID three, okay? So um, I get asked about this all the time, so I might as well deal with this one up front. Are there big performance issues around doing this, Ken? Like this is gonna be a ridiculously long table. Uh, the answer that, um, that I usually give on this one is twofold. Uh, number one, try it and see, um, see how it performs. I've actually found that it for performs fairly well. And number two, uh, even if it doesn't perform awesomely well, if it's the only way to solve the problem, then you're kind of stuck. And this is the only way I've found to solve the problem. So, you know, it's one of those kind of things that you gotta, gotta watch out for here. So, um, in an ideal world, uh, we're actually talking to IT and getting them to actually give us the correct information up front so we don't have to do these kind of things. But um, the reality is if it's self-service, that may not be the case. All right, now, SKeyBridge customer today queries, I've created both of these within the same instance of Excel. I need to lock these guys in. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say home, close and load, close and load two. I'm gonna create both of these queries right now as connection only, okay? Or in Power BI, we would disable the load on these going to say okay we'll just let it spin and do its thing here okay awesome that looks good there's my bridge customers there's my today query and basically at this point in time what I'm going to do is I'm now going to go and replace the foreign key in the sales table my fact table with the new one so I'm going to go into sales now I'm going into the actual sales table itself this time I'm not going to use the uh, staging query because this is the last step that I'm doing before I go to the data model so in this one, ooh, you know what? I actually forgot something. Missed a step in my query. Let me go back and just fix this for a second. There's something very, very important here that I forgot to do. And that is this. These two columns here, oops, these two, there we are, customer ID. This is the original uh, foreign key or primary key foreign key that we're using in relationships. And the dates column, both need to have their data type changed in order to be able to pull off the next step. We need to go right click, change type, and we need to change these to text. And this is really, really important. We do not replace. We need to add a new step. 
If I replace this, you know, I'm going to do the add new step, and you'll see what happens to it, is that everything basically gets left aligned as text, and my dates stay in the ISO format that I'm used to. If I had replaced this step, I would have a text-based representation of the date serial number, and that's not what I need. I need to have this as a text-based date. Okay, So very, very important there. I forgot to do that. Now when I go back to sales, before I actually go and make my merge, I'm going to do the same thing to these guys here. Now remember, this is a table that loads the power pivot. So we're actually doing some open heart surgery right now. We're going to go and say change type on this. We're going to load these both, as, or we're going to set them both to text. And again, add new step. I don't want to cause any potential problems here. So these guys are now both set to text as well. Now what I'm going to do is merge this against my bridge. So we're going to go merge queries. We're going to choose to use my bridge key for customers. And I'm going to merge my customer ID first, hold down my control key, and do date second. Customer ID, hold down my control key, and do date second. In my experience, you cannot do this if your date is still a date. It has to be text-based when you're actually making these merges between tables. Okay, So that's why we actually flip those things. It doesn't matter if these columns are in the same order or not, as long as customer ID is 1 and date is 2 and the same thing is happening here, or if I chose date as one and customer ID as two here, date would have to be one on this side. The, the relationship's gotta be in the same order when you're doing this. We use the default left out or join. We're gonna say okay. And at this point, it merges everything together and we can see all of their related records that are actually coming here, okay? Customer ID is number two. That's what we used for basing the merge. Here is the customer ID from our link field that we've actually got set up. So this is pretty cool. Because now what I can do is I can go and say expand. The only column I need is the new customer ID because it's been merged for that specific record on that specific date. And boom, just like that, customer ID 2, Bethann, her new customer ID number here or her surrogate key is going to be 3. Uh, for these guys here, because they're really early, um, in this particular case, it still stays as 1. Okay. Ooh, James likes that. All right, cool. Glad to see that. Uh, once I've got this done, I'm going to go back. This old customer ID here, not relevant. I'm going to press the delete key and make it go away. What has it done for me lately? Nothing. So we're going to get rid of that one. And now the final scenario for this one here, control A, transform. I'm going to reset my data types on all these columns. The fastest way that I know to do this when you've got multiple columns, control A, select all of these things, go to detect data type, and then go back and correct the ones that you don't like, like this one here. This one, to me, should be a currency. And this time, I am going to replace it because it doesn't need a new step for that. All right, so now, with that in place, my link customer ID here is a whole number. My date is back to a date. This is the new field that I've used for a relationship, which is going to be able to link to the link customer ID over here, which is also a whole number. That's good. So now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and say home, close, and load. And we should see that our sales table here does a nice little reload on this. Okay, so there it goes. I'm also just going to quickly go through and uh, and refresh um, this guy here, uh, and just make sure that that's got all the new columns in because I wanted to make sure that that uh, that surrogate key also ended up showing up in this side here. It's there now, so that's cool. I can go over to manage data model, into diagram view. Here's my new surrogate key, and we can link. There we are. And now, as soon as it plays nicely with me here, hide from client tools, hide from client tools. I want to make sure that everything stays nicely so that all only my measures are visible. And now, when we go back over here and we take a look, we can see that Alan's got sales records now, 256,000. He's moved his drinking establishment from Surrey to Abbotsford. Okay, so this is pretty cool. And I mean, here's where it gets really, really fun, right? Is at this point in time, if Alan turns out to be a bit of a cad, Let's say that you know he moves again because I don't know it lasted what uh, maybe it lasted 2018-1231 and then Beth Ann got tired of him um, and he moved in with uh, Josephine over here. There we go. So that happened on 2018. Whoops. Let's go 2019. 2019-01-01. If I now come back over here and do a data refresh all, what we should see is that Allen sales are going to, uh, going to decrease in Abbotsford and uh, we should see some sales that actually show up inside Vancouver uh, once it's all done. There we go. So 
um, at this particular time, Alan can be as uh, much of a cat as he wants. He can move wherever the heck he wants. And this is just going to work. And this is a beautiful thing, right? So that, that dimension is now a slowly changing dimension. It's no longer a static dimension. Okay, so let's go back now and take a look at what we actually did throughout this whole thing. Because basically, um, I went through and walk through all these steps. We checked to make sure the from and to columns existed. Now those did exist. We filled the values with today's date. We added a surrogate key using the key without meaning, created the bridge query, and merged it back into the fact table. So what's the recipes for these? The recipes look like this, okay? What did we do? We created a blank query using the formula date.from, date.time.localnow, Named the query today, load as a connection only, modified our staging dimension table to holding the two column, right-clicked it, replaced values with a hard-coded dates, and then basically went in and, and changed the date inside the formula using today, okay? Now, again, I already had an end date query, so I could have used end date instead of creating the today query, and that's what normally I would honestly do because I always want my dates to go to the end of my calendar table, but just for something different, here you go. Creating the surrogate keys without meaning. The recipe for it is this. You modify your dimension staging table. Optionally, you can sort by the primary key and the from column. Again, this is optional. It really doesn't matter if these keys go four, three, two, one, and they don't match up with what the actual customer ID numbers are because they are nonsensical. They're made up, okay? Um, the big thing here that you want to make sure of is, and I always like to rename my column and, and my nomenclature is to preface it with LNK uh, for a linking column because I know that that's what it's all about when I see that in my model. Um, the big thing to make sure of though is that once you actually make the change to this, you reload your dimension to make sure that it gets that new column because you're going to need it in order to be able to link it. Once you have those done, we create the merging bridge table. We convert the from and to date columns to a whole number. Um, again, as Kristen says, hey, you know what? Could I use date.from and date. Uh, you know, or, or sorry, number.from and, and whatnot instead? Um, the reason why I convert them to whole number and then use a formula like this is because it's less typing. It's a lot easier. That's why. So, um, so that's the, the route that I would go through it. We remove everything except for the primary key. That was our customer ID. Uh, we remove our everything except for our linking key. That was our link underscore customer ID and the dates column that we created by adding a new column. Um, and then we go through, expand the date to new rows, set the data type to a date, and convert our primary and dates to text as a new step, loaded to connection only. There we go. Merging the surrogate keys to the fact table. This is the last one. We actually do this in the fact table and basically convert our foreign key and our date column to text just so that they'll match the date and the old customer ID. Um, yeah, sorry, Kristen, you're right. Efficient, not lazy. Exactly. Um, so uh, we then merge these things together, the foreign key and date against the primary key and date from the, uh, from the surrogate table. Um, using the standard join. I just throw it up there so that the, nobody asks the question, do I use a left out or right out or you just use the, the thing you can, click as fast as possible, right? Um, and then uh, what we do is we expand that linking field out, remove the original foreign key, reset the data types, load up the data model and recreate those relationships. That's what we did. Now, reality is this job, as you're carefully going through and following your slides there, depending on how much data you're loading when you're dealing with this, is probably reliably somewhere between a five and 15 minute job, okay? So once you know what you're doing, that's the problem, right? So, but you've got all the steps now for, for this. You've seen the demo. I'm gonna give you these slides so you'll, you'll know what you're doing with it, but it still takes time and confidence to, to be able to build this out right. Now, this is where I wanna show you what we can do with monkey tools. And I'm actually super, super excited about this because um, <laughs> exactly one hour ago now, uh, we published an update to monkey tools that actually has this feature in it. This is brand, brand spanking new. And uh, this actually came from a conversation that I was actually having with, uh, with Christian at one point in time. I said, boy, I think this was about a month and a half ago. I said, wouldn't it be cool if somebody did this? But this would be really hard. And that's the kind of stuff that gets us going. So basically, um, what we are introducing today is we're introducing a new what we call an SCD2 uh, monkey, a slowly changing dimension monkey. This is all about um, the ability to create uh, surrogate keys with or without meaning, depending on what you actually need. Basically what it does is it automates the process of what we just did, okay? And that's what Monkey Tools is all about, is making your life easier because we wanna be lazy, I mean efficient, in the way that we do things, and we don't like doing all this stuff the hard way. Um, the other thing that I want you to be really aware of with Monkey Tools, if you haven't seen me talk about this before, is that we do not leave residual hooks inside your workbook, and this is something that is super, super important to me. 
What we leave behind when you run monkey tools is the queries or the relationships or the DAX measures that you have asked us to put in. There is nothing else that stays in that workbook, which means you can have one person in your organization that builds models with monkey tools, emails them out to everybody else in your organization, or preferably distributes them through Power BI, of course, not email. But the reality is that they will not have to have monkey tools installed in order to be able to refresh that model. This is something that I am very, very proud of and that we will never do is, is get something in place that requires and proliferates our software in your organization. Okay, that's not what we're about here. We're about a do no harm philosophy here. We want to help you not, well, I don't know. It doesn't seem like it's a good business model from my side sometimes, but, uh, but the reality here is that this is, uh, this is what it's all about. Okay. Uh, the other thing that's really cool about this is that this doesn't require, in most scenarios, breaking the relationship between your tables. You'll notice that in my recipes, I told you break the relationship first so you don't run into problems. We don't have to do that here. Okay. So this is cool. In most cases, there's one place where I, I have seen it, um, and that's where if you don't, if you actually try to refresh it and it fails, and you don't have your date columns on there already and you go and add them, well, at that point, you are going to have to break the relationship because we need you to get a refresh into Power Pivot so we can read it the first time. But once it's broken, it's okay. Um, I, after that, I can still read it. But you first got to get it in there. Uh, this is a pro feature, just for reference, but it will work inside the trial present period. So if you are, are trying to fix this slowly change in dimension, you can you know, run and one and done, and, and you're good to go. Uh, basically, the whole deal here is that this is a no-code interface to building yourself a quick and easy type 2 slowly change dimension. So here's what I am going to do. I'm going to go back in here, and uh, at least I am if I can get this thing to work right. There we go. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to go file. Um, actually, I'm going to do something here. I'm going to go save as, and I'm just going to go and save this one over keys without meaning. Save. Yep. I'm going to get rid of that because I actually want to keep this little table around so that I can be efficient or lazy, depending on how you look at it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to reopen the exact same file that we were in. Okay, so this is the guy that we started with. And you'll notice right over here that we have our original source data. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and put in 2016-0630. And I'm going to drop down over to my other one. And I'm going to grab these other two records that we put in. Control-C, Alt-Tab. We're going to go Control-V. All right. I've copied the data over. Let me get rid of the keys without meaning one. All right, so we're back in begin, okay? I want to show you before we go anywhere here that if I open up the data model and we go and take a look at this, the relationship is still based between customer ID and customer ID. And of course, if we go and we open this and we try and refresh our customers at this point in time, this is going to fail. All right, so there we go. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go query monkey. SCD2 monkey. Now, of course, it always opens up on my other screen when I'm doing this, but here we go. So basically what we do is, um, yeah, the customer IDs for the last two are one. That is correct. Uh, because when we look at this, it is Alan Frizzell. It's the same customer in all locations. So this is why the customer ID is the same. What I need to do is build a new, a new surrogate key that can correctly identify each instance of Alan in the, uh, in the area. So hopefully that makes sense for now. Um, You'll notice that this same picture here is what I actually showed you in the slides before, basically. We, need, uh, we tell you that we need your dimension table. It's got to have a fully populated from date. It's got to have a to date column. We will create this guy here, but we need you to identify what the primary key is for us most of the time. The fact table also has to have its foreign key and a fully populated date column. If you don't have those, you're going to get a red message up here, and we disable the next button. We won't let you go forward. Okay, So that's the first part. Once we do go forward, by default, we actually go and say, okay, you must want to look at the existing uh, relationships. Uh, we enumerate every single relationship inside this workbook, and we look for one that has two different date columns. They don't have to be called from and to, but as, unless it has that, we can't use it for a slowly changing dimension. In this workbook, there's only one. So we pick that one up, and we auto-populate everything that's here. If you had to break the relationship, you could always go and say new, and you could manually configure this. Now, you can create really bad stuff in this area. Um, I'm not going to protect you from that. We'll try and guide you, but the reality is you need to actually look at this stuff carefully if you're doing that. In this case, this works fairly well, and I would say 99% of the time, we're going to get all of these fields right if the relationship exists. The only two that are suspect are from and to because your columns may not be called those, so those could go in the reverse order. 
And if you have more than two date columns, you know, you're going to have to review that. So you still have to review this stuff, right? But reality is when we click next, we now come up to the screen. We learn your behaviors from this. Um, by default, I believe we set up that you're going to use a um, yes for keys with meaning because we believe you're a self, uh, self-service self BI pro. If you wanted to replicate the exact scenario we did before, you would set it up like this. No, don't use keys with meaning. Use today's date for your queries. I'm going to show you the keys with meaning. We're going to let our customers move up to a thousand times because we just can't tell what Alan's doing over there. Okay. Um, I believe our default starts with 100, but we actually log these defaults as you change them. I got to say, if you're setting up a slowly changing dimension to support over 100,000 changes, that dimension is probably not a slowly changing one. You might want to look at your model. Okay. Um, today's date, by default, you can also pick up. We actually enumerate all the scalar queries in your workbook. So in this case here, I'm going to use end date just to be different. If you don't have this and you don't want to use today's date, we will also allow you to pick up the last date in a specific table. Anything except for the dimension or the fact table that you're actually merging to because that would create a circular reference. But if you wanted to create the latest date and budgets, you can do that. Uh, we even let you rename your column here. You just have to identify and tell us for sure which date column you want. So say, I'm going to go with this one here. And now, if you're ready for this, according to my time clock at 6.07 p.m., I'm going to go and hit Create. And we're going to let this go and run. And basically what we should be able to see right now is that as it does its job, it's going to refresh the customers and the sales table. Um, and then it's going to go and it's going to recreate the relationship and boom, we're done. And it's now 6.08. And I don't think that was even a minute. So at this point, just to prove out that this worked, let me go over to the report here and you'll notice that here we are. Here's our three records. They are now showing up in Abbotsford, Langley, or if Surrey and Vancouver. If I go and take a look at the data model, you can see that here is my link customer ID and link customer ID. Unfortunately, I can't do this. I wish I could. I can't automatically hide those. Totally wish I could do that. Uh, but regardless, at that point, boom, it's done. That's a darn fine looking data model. Uh, blue Christian's mind, and that always makes me happy when that happens. Um, so, uh, so there we go. That is the, the type two slowly changing dimension, uh, dimension monkey uh, in, in place here. Um, Quickly, uh, because I know that I'm running uh, really low on time here, and I know that uh, the folks in Perth do have to get to work, um, I want to show you that basically what we've done is if I take a look at this, um, I don't actually remove any tables from the data model to make this happen. Uh, what I did is I actually took the information that was in my original customer's table, and I used it to create a new customer's staging table here. Uh, what I've done is this is all of the stuff that was in the original table that was going to the data model. And at this point here, I go and I add all the extra things that I needed in order to be able to sort it and do keys with meaning. That involves grouping some rows and doing some extra little uh, work around this in order to build up keys that, um, that actually have an instance on it, uh, which eventually leads me with this. Okay, You'll see it's all Power Query. There's no other magic here. We create the bridge table. I create that as a separate entity. And then basically what I did is I updated the sales just like you guys saw when I actually went through this thing uh, manually in order to get this done. And you can see that I very carefully name all of my steps so that they shouldn't conflict with yours because I don't think people are going to use those same step names, um, but it uh, gets it all set up nicely. All of that stays in Power Query. At this point, you can send this workbook to anyone and you can hit refresh and it'll just work. Okay, so that is the uh, that is the cool thing. Um, we're super, super proud of this guy here. Uh, if you've got monkey tools, um, just go and check for a refresh because, uh, as I say, we published it about an, just over an hour ago. Um, now, let me just uh, run this thing out here really quickly um, and just say if you're interested in learning how to do this kind of stuff and even more of it, um, we do have a dimensional modeling course at SkillWave where we teach how to build slowly changing dimensions uh, manually, as well as how we teach how to build uh, bridge tables and all kinds of fact and dimensions and, and reshaping everything. Uh, it's the ultimate dimensional modeling course. Uh, 12 and a half hours of content for Excel. We also have a full Power BI version that goes with it. Every one of them comes together. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a, a great, great class uh, and whatnot. I know uh, Christian's taken it. He, uh, he likes to say nice things. As a matter of fact, there's a great, uh, um, a great uh, testimonial on our site from Christian on that one. So if you're interested in that, um, you can find it at SkillWave. Uh, I also want to let you guys know that as on uh, starting Monday next week, um, we have the next intake for my self-service BI bootcamp. If you're really interested in learning how to do both Excel and Power BI, this is a huge product. It's about 33 hours 
Actually, it can be up to about 50 hours if you want to take advantage of everything um, of training and coaching. Uh, and this actually starts next week. It's got Q&A and Ask Me Anything sessions throughout the year. So, um, you know, we have uh, every month we're going to be having a, a two-hour Ask Me Anything session where all of our attendees that are subscribed to this uh, can participate, ask me questions, and we go through and work on it. Um, we have all, the, all these things get recorded in its archive and whatnot. Uh, as I say, the next intake of this starts on Monday. It's not too late to register. So if you're interested, please go and check out the Self-Service BI Bootcamp. It's a huge program. Um, again, that one's got a fantastic, couple of fantastic testimonials on it. I'm really proud of this one. Um, and as I say, we work with both Excel and Power BI in this thing to really teach you how all these things work together uh, to build some amazing models. If you like the stuff that I do, you can sign up for my newsletter here. We send you four free eBooks, lots of all other kind of information, including our favorite what's new in Excel, what's new in Power BI for the month as well. Um, plus, this is where you would hear if I'm going to say, I don't know, I'm really hoping that we get back to travel in the next couple of years and I can eventually actually come to Perth in person. This is where we would tell you that we're actually doing that. So if you're interested, uh, please sign up for that link. And again, I will make sure that Wynn has a copy of the slide deck. The last thing, this is my closing slide here. If you're interested in more on monkey tools uh, or connecting with me on social media, uh, these are the places where you can actually uh, make that happen. And on that note, that's what I got for you today. And I see Wynn's just come back on screen. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, I'm going to throw out a big thanks. Um, I don't know what your time frame is looking like right now or if there's any questions or, or whatnot. Um, I'm certainly happy to take those. Uh, but I want to just say thanks to everyone uh, for for showing up. I hope that um, I hope that you guys learned something, and I hope that Monkey Tools inspired you to think, boy, this is cool, because that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more inside that uh, to help you with uh, with your modeling journey and whatnot. So, thanks, folks. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ken. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Win. As always, pleasure, pleasure. Yeah. So, as, uh, if anybody does have any questions, please feel free to unmute and shout out. Otherwise, I know a lot of you do have to dash off to proper jobs. Uh, wow. Okay. There's a big long question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let me let me see if I could just uh, sort of go through. It's got the word V lookup in it too. Holy smokes. Um, let me see. Yeah, I'm going to say VLOOKUP is so 1995, slowly changing dimensions uh, to show the variance. Sure. Um, <laughs> um, so, I mean, so here, here's, here's, my, um, here's my thought, uh, Pranam, is I would be saying yes. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't believe that there's too much uh, anymore that would require you to, um, to load Power Query to an Excel table and do a VLOOKUP and then try and, and you know, push it back into data models or, or anything like that. Um, a slowly changing dimension is a is a great way of dealing with these things where where things do switch. I mean, you know, keep in mind though, the slowly changing dimension uh, solution is a solution to a slowly changing dimension problem. I would have to look at your model in more detail to know if that is the solution for your specific issue. Um, but if if the challenge is, is that you've been blowing apart one too many relationships and you you can't keep it going because things are are adding, then this is exactly what you want to go for. So. Um, so I hope that helps. I don't know, like I say, I mean, I'd have to look at it in more detail to sort of see what, uh, what, what goes on. A um, couple of other questions. Thanks for, for the, uh, for the um, comments. Uh, yes, I am at a standing desk, absolutely. Um, and uh, I enjoy doing that for my presentation. Uh, for Brent, do you need admin rights to install uh, Monkey Tools or can you do it around your admin's back? Uh, Monkey Tools installs without admin rights required, even though I don't advocate that you do things behind your IT admin's back. Yes, you absolutely can. Um, so, and, and actually, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, we put a lot of effort into making sure that it would install without admin rights because, uh, you know, I know just... Um, I know just how hard it is to to make it uh, work around sometimes with ID departments and and whatnot. So, um, so yeah. So thanks for all the uh, the positive comments there, Donald. Drive safe over there, man. Um, we can see you driving right now. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm and, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So awesome. there you go. Okay. At that point, I'll stop recording. And then, if anybody wants to ask a question who doesn't want to be recorded, then. Uh, you're more than welcome. So let me stop recording. Thanks for that, Ken. All right. Thanks very much, Wynn. I appreciate that. And thank you for uh, for recording it. Um, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it's always now we get now we get the fun part of actually trying to figure out how to actually get